In the harsh cold of October 1982, Antarctica was more than just an icy expanse. Deep in the heart of this frozen wonderland, a scientist named Joseph Farman was on a mission amidst relentless snowstorms. While conducting his regular measurements of the Earth's ozone levels, an oddity occurred. His trusted machine reported a staggering 40% decline in the ozone levels, a number that seemed almost fictional. Perplexed and skeptical, Joseph convinced himself it was an anomaly, perhaps a malfunction of his aging equipment. After all, with the advanced satellites orbiting our planet, someone else would have noticed, right? Returning in October 1983, armed with a brand new machine, Joseph hoped for a different result. Yet the readings spelled an even more disturbing tale. The ozone had declined further. In 1984, desperate for clarity, Joseph shifted his research location, traveling a thousand miles to a new research station. The readings here, however, mirrored the haunting decline. Confronted with three consecutive years of drastic ozone depletion, Joseph could no longer ignore the implications. It wasn't just his machines, it was happening in reality. With undeniable evidence in hand, he approached NASA. To everyone's astonishment, NASA's previous data had overlooked the glaring hole. The revelation of an expanding ozone hole over Antarctica sent shockwaves worldwide. The previously ignored danger was now a glaring global threat. With the ozone hole expanding year after year, dire predictions emerged. By 2050, the protective ozone layer might be entirely gone, threatening every life form on Earth. But the question is what mysterious force carved this gaping ozone hole in our atmosphere? The answer might surprise you. But before we dive into the enigma, let's first unravel the story of the ozone layer itself. The ozone layer, a protective shield enveloping our planet, is both mysterious and vital. While you might recall some basics about it from your school days, the significance of ozone goes far beyond just a chemical formula or a layer in our atmosphere. Let's delve a bit deeper. Ozone O3 is unique due to its triatomic structure, comprised of three oxygen atoms. Contrast this with the diatomic structure of the oxygen O2 we breathe, formed roughly 600 million years ago. This distinctive layer floats between 15 to 35 kilometers above the Earth. While the ozone's concentration peaks at about 32 kilometers above the surface, its presence in the atmosphere is remarkably sparse, only amounting to 0.0015%. Despite its minimal concentration, the ozone layer plays a monumental role in Earth's well-being. Its genesis is a captivating dance of molecules. Sun's ultraviolet radiation strikes oxygen molecules, fragmenting them into individual oxygen atoms. As these solitary atoms then unite with oxygen molecules, ozone is birthed. The reaction can be simply put as O2 plus O equals sign O3, but nature is all about balance. Just as ozone is created, it also gets dismantled. When an ozone molecule meets an oxygen atom, they react and revert to oxygen. This cyclical process, known as the Chapman cycle, was first elucidated by scientist Sidney Chapman in 1929. The reaction facilitating the breakdown of ozone due to light is termed photodissociation or photolysis. But why is the ozone layer so crucial? Primarily, it's our guardian against the sun's perilous ultraviolet, UV radiation. Without it, we'd be exposed to harmful rays, leading to adverse consequences such as sunburns, compromised immunity, cataracts, and even cancers. Now, one might wonder, if ozone is our shield, why do we still need sunscreens? Here's where it gets interesting. The sun is a prodigious emitter of a wide spectrum of rays. Ranging from visible light to hazardous gamma or X-rays, the sun showers the Earth with an array of radiation. Particularly concerning are the ionizing UV rays, which have the ability to penetrate and even modify our DNA. UV rays can be classified into three types based on their wavelengths. UVA, 315 to 400 nanometers. UVB, 280 to 315 nanometers. UVC, 100 to 280 nanometers. Of these, UVC is the most potent and dangerous. Thankfully, our ozone layer intercepts and neutralizes X-rays, gamma rays, and the menacing UVC rays. However, it only partially absorbs UVB radiation and does not filter out UVA at all, hence our reliance on sunscreens. A majority of sunscreens shield against UVB, but for comprehensive protection, you'd need a broad-spectrum sunscreen, safeguarding against both UVA and UVB. Data science has been instrumental in dissecting the intricate interplay of UV radiation and its effects. By meticulously analyzing UV data, scientists have discerned the precise impact of different wavelengths on our skin. Leveraging these insights, companies have concocted sunscreens with specific ingredients, ensuring optimum defense against UV threats. The narrative on ozone depletion provides a poignant story of the intricate relationship between Earth's natural processes and the unintended consequences of human activities. 
This complex relationship is vital not only for our planet's health, but also for every living organism on Earth. Diving into the evolution of the ozone layer, we see it as Earth's natural sunblock. Formed 600 million years ago, this layer was pivotal for early marine life, which remained deep within oceans to evade the sun's harmful rays. The development of the ozone layer was, in many ways, a game changer. It provided a safeguard, paving the way for life to thrive in shallower waters and eventually on land. This transition was undoubtedly a significant evolutionary leap. The discovery of ozone itself, however, is relatively recent in human history. In the 19th century, Christian Schoenbein identified it while experimenting with electrolysis, naming it after the Greek term ozane, meaning to smell. Its unique triatomic structure, consisting of three oxygen atoms, was unveiled in the subsequent years, but with knowledge came realization. While ozone high up in the atmosphere shields us at ground level, it can be harmful. The gas's acrid, distinctive smell, often associated with thunderstorms or electric sparks, can be toxic upon prolonged exposure. This realization took shape through the experiences of early researchers like Schoenbein, who documented adverse effects when in close contact with the gas. In the 1920s, with the invention of the Dobson spectrophotometer, scientists could accurately measure ozone concentrations. Now, returning to the pressing question we posed earlier, how exactly did this ominous ozone hole form? In the 1970s, NASA was concerned that their lunar missions might be harming our atmosphere, especially the ozone layer. To everyone's relief, the spacecrafts weren't the culprits. Instead, a common chemical found in daily products like hairsprays, shaving creams, and fridges was the real threat. Known as chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, in 1974, three scientists released a paper that later earned them a Nobel Prize. They pointed out a significant problem. A chemical called CFCs, commonly used in many products, was damaging our ozone layer. At that time, CFCs were popular because they were stable and versatile, found in everyday items. But when these CFCs went up into the sky and met sunlight, they released a substance called chlorine. This chlorine started attacking the ozone molecules, breaking them apart, and in the process, more chlorine got released. It was like a domino effect. One bit of chlorine could damage lots of ozone molecules, and this harmful cycle just kept going. In essence, these everyday chemicals were creating a destructive cycle high in our atmosphere, eating away at the protective ozone layer. After the paper was published, some other scientists tested its claims. They confirmed its accuracy. Each chlorine from the CFCs was seriously harming the ozone. However, early predictions suggested only a 2-4% reduction in the ozone layer by 2099. Since this seemed like a small amount, people weren't too concerned. Coming back to Joseph Farman, an Antarctic researcher whose calculations we discussed earlier consistently measured the ozone layer. In 1982, he was shocked to discover a drastic depletion of one-third of the ozone layer over Antarctica. Considering previous scientific estimates only predicted a 2-3% decline, he doubted his equipment. Even after switching machines and locations, the readings were consistent. When he alerted NASA, they confirmed his findings with disturbing visuals of the rapidly expanding ozone hole. By August 1985, maps of this ozone hole were made public. Despite the term hole, it's more an area where the ozone layer has significantly thinned. The measurements, typically between 300 to 500 Dobson units, had areas falling below 200 Dobson units. The best thing that happened in this whole saga was that after finding out that the ozone layer was getting damaged in 1985, leaders from all over the world decided to do something about it. In 1987, they agreed on a plan called the Montreal Protocol. This plan got everyone on board to quit using harmful chemicals, known as CFCs, that were damaging the ozone. Not only did it lay out steps to cut down these harmful substances, but it also offered support to developing countries to find safer alternatives and new technologies. Every country in the world agreed to this plan, marking it as the only treaty ever to get full approval. This achievement makes it the most impactful environmental agreement in history. Not long after, the biggest manufacturer of CFC started to reduce their production. They started using safer ones called HFCs instead. By the 1990s, fewer and fewer people were using the bad chemicals. Over the past 30 years since the inception of the Montreal Protocol, we've observed promising developments. The once expanding ozone hole is on a path of recovery. Predictions indicate that by 2065, full restoration is plausible. Yet, our environmental responsibilities continue to evolve. Post the CFC ban, hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, emerged as the replacement. While they presented no threat to the ozone layer, their potency as greenhouse gases accentuates the challenges of climate change. Their rapid proliferation necessitated action, 
leading to the 2016 amendment to the Montreal Protocol, which seeks to curtail HFC use. However, HFCs are just one piece of the puzzle. Climate change is a big challenge for all of us today. People around the world are now seeing and feeling the real effects of this problem. We can't just wait and see, we need to act now. Giving up isn't an option. When we all work together, we can make a difference and protect our planet. By sticking to our goals, we can create a better and safer world for everyone.